I think we're seeing the takeover of our country by an extreme wing of the deep state. And uh, my work uh, as a historian uh, and as an activist lead me to that conclusion, a conclusion that's quite obvious to all of you, which is why we're all here on this very uh, inclement day. Um, and by the way, I want to thank a group, speaking of uh, the elderly makeup of the room and, and the panel, I want to thank the Great Panthers, who of course took the lead in, in organizing this, so thank you very much. So look, I think we need to think specifically about what kind of uh, groups we want to join, what kind of actions we want to participate in, how we can learn from the past. And by the way, the elderly do have some wisdom to impart about that. Um, so I was at the Black Panther 50-year uh, anniversary conference uh, a few uh, weeks ago at the Oakland Museum, and I think that exhibit is still up. And I would encourage people to go there as well. And there was a number, I, I spent some time with uh, Kathleen Cleaver, uh, heard Erica Huggins speak, uh, and talked to some of the young Black Lives Matter women uh, who are behind uh, you know, the beginning of that movement. And I could see that they were inspired also by that example in good and bad ways. And looking at things to avoid uh, and things that the Panthers did right, the things that Panthers did wrong. But one of the key things is that once you start to organize and once you start to mobilize your community and once you start to have an impact, they're going to come after you. They're going to infiltrate you. They're going to provoke you. They're going to uh, shoot you. They're going to do everything they can to undermine and crush these movements. So again, we have to know our history. We have to read books. We have to learn from this. Uh, sure. Vulcan. Yeah, Ron. Yeah. From a past life. But there, there's, sir, there's a couple of salient points I want to make. Don't expect the Democrats to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean just, just don't expect that. That's not going to happen. The lesser of two evil policy, the lesser of two evil policy is euphemism from we at the top are going to tell you what your choices are and this is what you have to choose from. It is not a policy from the bottom up. The Democrats practice a policy from the top down. That's what lesser two evils were. I'm 64. I remember when they first came up with this concept. Oh, it's supposed to be one time only. Oh, we have to stop the other guy. Oh, we need a lesser of two because the other guy can't possibly win. That has become ingrained in our dialogue in this country. Tell it. The Democrats. We live here in San Francisco in supposedly, according to the Chronicle and Fox News, is this progressive bastion. And right here, they can't stop the POA from shooting a black or brown person in the back where their hands are up, where their hands are down, where their hands are sideways, where their hands are in their pocket, where they have a gun, where they don't have a gun, where they're standing, look at it. It doesn't matter. You're getting shot right here, right here. Why don't you, uh, yeah. Let's look, look real quickly at Trump, per se. Now, we're, we're concerned about fascism or neo-fascism in the U.S., which is really just a continuation of the police state that we've had going on all along. Mm -hmm. Spying on us, following us around, monitoring the population, being able to use the government to, to, to threaten us in some way. That's ongoing. He just may accelerate that with a new attorney general so that protesting could be a felony. And, you know, and to, to, be, to scare us even more. But don't, don't misunderstand Trump. That doesn't extend transnationally to the rich people. He's in support of enriching the rich more. He's already talked about tax cuts. And that. So his agenda is still neoliberal. The austerity side of neoliberal is going to happen here. The concentration of wealth side of neoliberal will continue to happen globally. And he's already talking about expanding the military. 
And we are already have troops in 100, people killing people in 130 countries in the world. And unleashing the police, he's talked about. Hmm. Exactly. So, I mean, that's, we're not seeing a, a major transformation here other than our own repression. So my one idea about how we resist is to not only all our organizations, but to really focus on the idea of human rights. Because mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. that's our, our center ground. That's where we can have Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Bill of Rights. That's where we can stand. I'll stop. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with uh, Ron Dixon about the Democratic Party. It's a corporate capitalist party. It's interesting to note that the Council on Foreign Relations is more p powerful in the in the Democratic Party than it is in the Republican Party. It is very powerful in both parties, but, but it's more powerful in the Democratic Party even. And the Democratic administrations typically have more council yeah. leaders and members uh, running there uh, in the administrations. But I think we should be focusing on, among other things, I mean, we all these things, you know, mass demonstrations, uh, civil disobedience, nonviolent. I think nonviolent is very important. They're going to jump on people if they're not nonviolent. That, that's what you can really get into trouble. And that will dis that will hurt our movement, I think, with the non, uh, not being nonviolent. We need to be nonviolent. But I, I'm a big one on um, we should wor have workplace and neighborhood organizing at the grassroots. Uh, starting out, one way to start out is to we want to get together to protect people who might be vulnerable under this right wing, you know, uh, white supremacist, anti immigrant administration. We want to get people together. We need each other. We need every human being to be working on this resistance, this fight back. And we can do it with organizing unions, organizing at the neighborhood level, the precinct level, trying to get neighborhood councils going. That We can name them whatever we want, uh, but they could be named, you know, resistance precinct councils or something that's not too out there so we can bring people in who maybe aren't very political to begin with. But we can then have a dialogue with people you know. And then that way we can build up to having what we need, I think, is a new political party based in the people, in the neighborhoods, in the workplaces, in the schools, in the unions. That's what we need is a new grassroots run political party that from the grassroots. And so that's what I would advocate for the future for our organizing, at least one aspect of it. I like the emphasis here on new, or new uh, collectivities because one of the things, one of the problems with what we're seeing is the aging and the uh, senescence, really, the dying out of both the old parties, which, uh, let's just focus on the Democrats. They lost the working class back in the Vietnam War. And uh, I'm afraid I was part of it because uh, we, Berkeley had a, a labor union uh, representative, but he supported the war. So a bunch of us went out and supported Ron Dellums, and uh, he was able to push him out and eventually push the Democratic Party out of support for the war. That happened with the McGovern campaign, and that when then they, the so-called reforms in the Democratic Party favored the middle class and were designed to limit the power of the unions. And I'm, I, I don't think the unions were the answer, frankly. I think they were aging too. We have some unions that are on the right side, but they're often the service unions, the old union movement, like the Democratic parties, is, is sliding into history and we have to replace it. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see the Republican Party split in two in this coming. There's something called Hatchek's Law in political science, that once you get power, you're not uh, allied anymore, you're competing. And uh, the Supreme Court, for example, if they really want to get their man on the Supreme Court, they're going to have to get rid of the filibuster. And now suddenly the Democrats who used to be against the filibuster are going to be for it, and they should be for it. We should do anything to stop getting Trump's nominees on the Supreme Court. Those kind of pressures, I predict, are going to maybe split the Republican Party. You could see a new party emerge out of the rubble, and I hope there are enough decent Democrats in the Democratic Party that they would join a genuine new movement to represent opposition to the whole shebang, the way it's been working for the last 20 years. Um, he makes a couple of points, and some people in the audience wanted to say what I wanted to say, and that is basically, unfortunately, the way the labor movement has evolved. And I mean, when you, I looked at the numbers on the, on, on the map there, and basically, you cannot negate the fact 
that the unions did not control their own members. You look at that map yeah. and you see where the Democrats won, where the Republicans won. And there are unions up and down this country. I mean, I know that the union is not as strong as it has been, but it is obvious by any barometer that you want to use that they are, their, their members are doing something completely different from what they're advocating, and it's no use pretending that the AFL-CIO is in charge of this. They can't deliver, and it's just that simple. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> it's, <clears throat> I, the, I, I hope, you know, whether or not you think it's even worth trying, I, I, I'm glad to see that, you know, that, that uh, the uh, Democrats are gonna have to have her do some serious reevaluation. The fact that they, for example, they expected 95% of the black population in this country to vote for them. They allocated 2% of their vast uh, of financial resources to bring out the black vote. Um, they, and, and, and instead they're trying to win over some, you know, uh, suburban Republican women who, who voted um, only 1% less for Trump than they did for Romney uh, for four years ago. I mean, it's kind of taking, you know, you know just to serve sort of, uh, you know, taking for granted um, the, the support of, of various uh, con constituencies. I was just going to, um, I was going to add, because uh, someone just passed a note saying, where are the women on the panel? I wanted to reiterate what uh, Stephen had said earlier. Rebecca Gordon, who I happened to publish uh, her most recent book, she's a professor here. Uh, American Nuremberg, I really urge everyone to check out that book, because the war crimes that she explores by the criteria set at Nuremberg after World War II, that a number of high-level U.S. officials from the Bush and Obama administrations are guilty of are only going to be aggravated under a Trump administration because we see them openly calling for a return to the most excessive and criminal uh, practices of the Bush administration, whether it's torture, illegal detention, black sites, and so on. They're openly calling for this. The new head of the CIA, uh, Pompeo, uh, the new uh, uh, attorney general, and Mike Flynn. So, uh, Rebecca Gordon, uh, wherever you are, um, we are missing she's, you She's here. sick in bed. She was going to be here. Right. Can I just say, complete my one thought, going back to what Peter Phillips said, saying that one key core area that we can all stand together on is human rights. Unfortunately, the American people have not shown much sympathy or empathy for those whose human rights are being violated in the last 15 years overseas. There is no anti-war movement to speak of, but I do uh, have great faith in the Black Lives Matter movement, in the Standing Rock movement, uh, and in these other movements that I think can feel empathy with people who are on the receiving end of American violence overseas. I know back in the Black Panther days, there was great feelings of solidarity between the Panthers and the Vietnamese people, uh, people in the Middle East and so on. We need to establish, uh, again, those bonds between all of us whose rights are being violated. Okay, so I'm of the opinion that Trump did not win this election as much as Hillary lost this election. And the reason why Hillary, um, and the reason why Hillary lost this election was because of the contempt with which she treated the left. Yeah. Right? She yeah. stole the nomination from Sanders. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I went into the voting booth and voted with rage yeah. for Jill Stein. Yeah. Right? Rage. Right? Right? I would rather fight in opposition because for me, there was an issue of dignity. Yeah. What is the dignity of the left? Yeah. Right? We saw an enormous movement that was crushed by the establishment Democratic Party. And I think that that needs to be addressed with regards to how we organize going forward. That's yeah. right. Thank you. Good man. Good man. I work with Code Pink, Women for Peace, of which there's several of us here today. I say work, volunteer, 
Many of Code Pink would not even uh, support Bernie because Bernie explicitly agreed to Obama's drone assassination program. In fact, he did that not he did that while he was running, and so many people could not support him. And I supported him a little bit more than some, but not completely. They also, of course, are horrified by Hillary Clinton. Um, as am I, I would never have thought I'd, I'd vote for her, but I believe in this election, as I think it was Arun Gupta who said, the thing about crying wolf, when everybody says the lesser evil, the lesser evil, the lesser evil, sometime the wolf does come. Uh, yeah, hi, I wanted to make a comment and a question then for, for the group or whoever wants to add, a answer it. Uh, first of all, our friend over here mentioned Jill Stein, voting for Jill Stein, which I did too. Um, good, I'm glad to see that. And, you know, we kept hearing, oh, Green Party's just for white people, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I talked I talk to so many African-American friends, brothers and sisters and colleagues, and so many people were, were drawn to it. But anyway, the question is this. Uh, uh, you know, and I, I, can't, I can't say I was truly inspired about the Green Party, partly because it's so small, but, but I got inspired when I went to a rally, Jill Stein and uh, Amaju Baraka, in, uh, in Berkeley, and there were quite a few people, you know, a couple hundred people there, but the thing that inspired us, my wife and I, was that the speakers were, were half a dozen young black men and women inspired about the Green Party. In fact, one of the young women said, you know, I was talking to my friend and we said, man, why don't we go down to the Green Party and take it over? And they went down to the Green Party and the Green Party said, yeah, take us over. <laughs> <laughs> and they got involved, a young Native American man from up Northern California says, first time he ever been involved in politics, and here he is at the Green Party going around the country with Jill Stein, you know, and they were inspired, they were on fire. And I said, you know, I started thinking for the first time, you know, what if there was a party, the Green Party maybe, where a lot of different movements could come under this umbrella? Well, I have to jump in because I've been an activist in the Green Party for uh, over 20 years. And I ran for the Green Party can and as a candidate twice. Uh, so uh, we asked Bernie Sanders to join us as our presidential candidate. Jill Stein was willing to step aside and ask Bernie Sanders, would you join us? You'll be our presidential candidate. He said no. If he would have said yes, we would have Bernie Sanders, in my view. He would be president right now. That's my view. Next. Okay. How, how, about, okay. how about the dirty trick, the AP trick on the eve of the California primary saying it's all over, Hillary's won. Remember that one? Yeah. Okay, next, next, next question. Hi, uh, I guess you mentioned um, creating space for human rights across the world, outside of the US, that we need to bring it back. And I completely wholeheartedly agree, but what about human rights here? domestic human rights, Both. communities of color, and Both. all disenfranchised communities, how do we reach these Trump voters, and how do we build bridges to have them understand and create empathy for us? To understand how to move forward, we need a better understanding of where we are now and why we are this way. I think, it's, I think we need to know more about and near, we need to know more, I mean, this is just me talking because it's my shtick, but we need to know more about the history of this country, that when I talk about the deep state and deep politics, the things that aren't mentioned in the newspapers, there's so much that needs to come out, and that's why the idea of an alt media is so desperately important. Um, th th there's one thing that we have on our side, you know, that they don't, that's truth and justice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And, I, you know, if, if you believe, as I do, that the history is stumbling in a very erratic way, back and forth, back and forth, sideways both ways, but it's tending in the right direction, we put our lives to be part of that tendency, educate ourselves, organize ourselves, and take heart in the fact that, you know, especially if you're an older person like me, 
You think Trump is the end of the world? I thought Nixon was the end of the world. Reagan. I thought Reagan was the end of the Reagan. world. And then I said, well, at least they, they will be one-term presidents. No, they were. And so was George, oh yeah, George W., the worst of them all, practically. They were all two-term presidents. But I also have to say, with respect to war, you know, he was elected twice. Yeah. <laughs> He was elected to two terms. Uh, when you come to war, important things have to be done with Russia. And some of the most important were done by the man I hated so much, by Nixon and by Reagan. And I'm waiting to see if Putin will f come to Washington in the first months of uh, Trump's presidency. Uh, the, we have to, Hillary said, have an open mind. There's no, we've never had a, a, a one president who was so rotten that no good came from him. And the reverse is true. We've never had one so good that something terribly rotten didn't come from them. And this is a very slow process to save America's soul. But you know, what we do is very important for the rest of the world. Let's mm -hmm. not forget that. Let's reach out to the rest of the world mm -hmm. because they're plugging for us not for Trump. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. Yeah. In terms of human rights, I, I think what, when, what's really important is I think we need to make the linkage between human rights at home and human rights abroad. I mean, the sweatshops that multinational corporations set up uh, uh, overseas are directly related you know, to, to the poverty and oppression uh, uh, here at home, where people do not have good manufacturing jobs, union jobs that gave them uh, dignity, gave them rights, had had, had support uh, networks you know, uh, 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 for them. Um, uh, in a resolution by a huge bipartisan majority, in which uh, Nancy Pelosi was a co-sponsor, um, they uh, 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 gave unconditional support for Israel's war on Gaza, uh, claiming uh, claiming that because uh, that Hamas. Uh, you had put its uh, had its um, fighters and uh, 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 officials in uh, civilian uh, mosque hospitals and neighborhoods. Therefore, these were uh, fair targets. Now, Hamas. I mean, and I'm I'm very anti-Hamas uh, on a whole number of levels. But but they're a militia. They're a militia. They don't aren't in a base. They live at home. Uh, their, 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 their officials live, live in civilian neighborhoods. They, go to, they all go to civilian mosques. They go, all go to civilian hospitals. In other words, what the Democratic Party along with the Republicans are saying is that if you're fighting terrorists, it's a free fire zone. You know, they, and, and, and you know, this is the same kind of rationalization you hear, you know, not just for Israel for Gaza, but those who are defending the Assad regime and, and their terror bombing in Aleppo, or the Saudis and their terror bombing in, in, in Yemen. But think about how that might apply here with the increased militarization of police. You know, if you, you start accusing, you know, people in minority communities, poor neighborhoods of, 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 of being terrorists or, or harboring a terrorist or, or whatever, then these neighborhoods themselves can become free fire zones. Hello? Can you hear me? David, this question is addressed to you. Hi. Uh, you're talking about organizing alt media, but we have an alt media. We have an independent progressive media movement, as you know, in this country. Most of you probably read most of these publications, and, but they tend to only reach us. So what are you talking about in terms of an alt movement and how can progressive media work with you on that? Well, great question. You all heard that question, right? Okay, so how do we amplify our voice? There's lots of left-wing uh, media outlets. We all know them, publications and so forth. But you know what? We're all in our different silos. We all have our different, like, you know, funders, foundations, George Soros money, and we all are talking to ourselves. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing because the alt-right you know, uh, built from there too. They had an echo chamber where they like, you know, uh, basically built their base. You do have to build your base. So I'm not putting down the echo chamber effect. It's very important. But we have to go bigger than that. So how do you go bigger? We need to start thinking of a cable channel, which has been discussed for a long time. Or as a step towards that, a streaming channel, a digital channel online that's a lot cheaper, where we have video 24-7, because people like their, you know, news through video, not just through text. 
it takes all our best thinking and fundraisers to come together, which is why I've called for a meeting in New York that's going to happen the first week of December. Uh, a number of people, even from the corporate media, Van Jones has been invited to come to this and has expressed an interest. I know people have different <laughs> feelings about Van. But I'm saying at this point, one big tent. One big tent of people who want to take down the Trump administration through the power of the media. Um. I have a question and a comment. Um, first of all, uh, people have asking, are asking about an organization. There's an organization called Surge showing up for racial justice. And for white people, it's really, really important right now for us to, to, to train ourselves and to hook into organizations of color that are standing up for themselves because they're going to be heavily targeted. Um, two, speaking of global, global warming and immigration, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on both the global wars and, and climate change and, and the immigration crisis that is already happening. Well, militarism, of course, is the, one of the worst polluters of, of uh, you know, putting in carbon into the air, both the large armies and, of course, war. I mean, you see what's happening in uh, Syria and Iraq with all these things being, uh, the oil wells being exploded, people trying to burn something in order to prevent the bombs from coming from the planes. So militarism and war are absolutely horrendous for climate change. But we, ha we face, of course, a big problem because we have these climate deniers who now are coming into power, but the people who have been in power, they're not climate deniers. They say, oh yeah, there is, there is a, a problem here, but then they do almost nothing about it. The Paris Agreement, for example, is extremely weak. Yes, it's a start. Yes, we could pre pressure. It's better if we have it than not. I agree. But the problem with the people before, the Democratic Party, they didn't really take it that seriously. And we need really serious changes in order to try to save the planet and save humanity on, uh, you know, our existence on the planet. I'm so glad you brought up the problem of global warming, climate change. It tends to get passed over because we feel so powerless, you know. But we have to... We have to deal with it, and I'd like to point out, you know, there was a carbon tax up in the state of Washington voted on, there was on the model of what they're doing in Canada. And this is an example of the movement not getting their stuff together, because that's what was proposed, and it, of course it was opposed by the Koch brothers, but it was also opposed by the Sierra Club, and it was opposed by Naomi Klein for the very good reason that it wasn't going to achieve the limited goals of the Paris Agreement. Well, I think this is an example of total confusion. I think you've got to make something go become real so that you can then attack it and say it's not strong enough. And uh, that's why I'm glad Canada did what it did. I'm sorry that they didn't vote for that thing in Washington. Then we could have had the time of our lives saying, well, that's ridiculous. It's not going to begin. But you're bringing it into the dialogue of the country, and it really isn't there right now. And it has to be, because if it's not my life that's at stake, it's the life of my grandchildren. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? My name is Maxine Anderson. Two organizations, League of Women Voters, fighting for voting rights for 100 years, starting with women and going across the world. There's an organization in San Francisco. Look online, League of Women Voters San Francisco. The other organization, San Francisco for Democracy, came out of the Howard Dean movement when he was running for president. Very progressive, try to do as much work as possible. Now you got two more organizations. The other thing is, I think we need, I've heard people say that they want something they can do. And sometimes people aren't joiners of organizations. But you can stand up when somebody looks at your neighbor and says, why don't you go back to your country? You can stand up and tell them, no, we don't do that here. You can, if when they get around to the point of telling people you have to sign up if you're Muslim, you can sign up too and say you are, I don't care if you're Baha'i. You can sign up and say, yeah, me too. And if enough of us say, me too. But this is not a fight. This, this is not a fight that you can sit in the corner and hope is going to go away. This is a fight where people, I'm sorry to say it, there's going to be blood on this one. That's just my opinion. 
in my commentary. But you're going to have to stand up and decide what it is you're going to be willing to die for. Because the people who are in power now have shown you who they are. Yeah. And I suggest you start believing them right. when they tell you. Amen. Can I, can, I, can I just, in response to that, re reiterate that the people at Standing Rock are already standing up to the worst forces of pollution, yeah. of uh, the environmental destruction, and they are so organized. Uh, you know, I was at Occupy at Zuccotti Park, and it was thrilling, and it was wonderful. A little, uh, the leaderless problem was a problem for me, too. But Standing Rock is incredibly organized. Everyone has to participate in direct action workshops when they get there. Uh, it's closely monitored because it is infiltrated. They're trying to destroy that camp every step of the way. There's drones overhead. There's militarized police surrounding them. It's a war zone. And yet they have medics who have volunteered young medics there who, by the way, the police target during actions. They go after the medics to try and put them out of action. There are young lawyers who have volunteered, a legal collective there. They're building a clinic there. They're building housing there for the winter for people. It's the most inspiring thing I've seen since the 60s because of all the people it's brought together from around the country and around the world. And it's, it's organized resistance and it's an inspiration for us all. I think we're going to see a huge, huge, huge influx of new activists, especially among the young. And I think we're going to see a lot of new leaders, uh, particularly women of color, uh, that are going to be so important in, in future leadership roles. These, these, they need to be encouraged. At the same time, I think it underscores the importance of, the, of, of organization, of training. You know, that is to make sure that these activist groups, you know, uh, I mean, we can't just have street protest after street protest after street protest or people sitting in one place you know, in, in an occupation or whatever. We need to think about, you know, the, the uh, um, a, a, you know, short term uh, achievable goals consistent with a long term radical vision. We need to have a, a logical sequencing of tactics. We need to understand the importance of nonviolent discipline. We need to have uh, the, the kinds of, um, of, um, uh, of organization, media savvy, uh, know when to work within the system and when to work without the, uh, outside the system, uh, and, and, and to, have, to think strategically, whether it be an electoral campaign or, or a guerrilla war or anything else, you need to think strategically. One is that a, a, a government is only powerful as people's willingness to obey it. And we have seen how governments from the Philippines to, to um, Egypt, to Poland, to Chile, to, to, to Serbia, to Tunisia, you know, have fallen through massive non-cooperation by their people. And, 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 and South Korea, yes. Um, and we're gonna, I think we can see, um, you know, and, and, and we're not necessarily talking about, you know, uh, bringing down the, uh, the, the uh, administration altogether. I don't think that's realistic, but we can sure make it difficult to implement policies, both by those of us on the streets, but I also have a feeling we're going to see a lot of more, you know, passive resistance, uh, you know, lost computer files, uh, misplaced memos, et cetera, in all parts of the bureaucracy, civil servants who, who uh, even though they are, you know, part of government, are not not willing to go as far and extreme in implementing uh, the, the very dangerous policies of uh, this particular uh, administration, uh, but at the same time, let, let's let we got to be well, we got to be conscious about these these kinds of things, uh, especially again those of us uh, in in in, in uh, uh, groups that have been identified traditionally uh, with, with, with oppression. Yes, there's I'd, I'd there's like many kinds of oppression. And it's very important, but we can unite around class. It's no accident that the mass media in this country rarely talks about class. They talk about race, they talk about gender, they talk about lots of other things, but they don't talk about class. That's no accident. They don't want the working class, which is the major, you know, 70, 75 or 80 percent of the people, they don't want the working class to have class consciousness. They'd much rather have them have white consciousness or some other kind of consciousness. So class is a unifying element. We always have to have that as a key. So the brother's completely right about mentioning that and keeping that in the forefront of our mind. And class is a unifying element. That's when we can come together with enough power to take things over. And I've been itching. Thank you. I've been itching to say all this time that we haven't talked, I, don't, I haven't heard the phrase yet, income disparity or disparity of wealth. Because the history of this country is that 
after FDR, but even beginning with Theodore Roosevelt, there was huge disparity of wealth, but it was slowly reducing. We were getting a more egalitarian society. And since 1980 and the Reagan Revolution, it's been going the other way until it is unconscionable. And that's what's ruined our politics, because they can go out and buy a candidate or buy a party. And the, that's why we have the private primaries where the candidates are really, as a rule, selected by going up to find the funding before they go out and campaign going down. So yes, Trump didn't win the election, Clinton lost it by in incompetent and almost, uh, uh, malevolence almost, and they, uh, the DNC putting the money in the wrong place. So uh, I think we would be wrong to spend all our time organizing to protest the last election. It, it happened. Let's learn from it. Let's wait for the really detailed analyses are done and see. Voter suppression is a terrible problem where people have to wait in line forever to vote. It was a problem here, too, in California when it was Sanders versus Clinton. In the primary, it was. I'm, so, I've talked to somebody who heard the person in front of them being told they couldn't vote because they were independent, which was a lie. So it, it, it's, it, yes, we have to be aware of these things, but it's not the big problem because electoral prob problems are a phenomenon of something deeper wrong in this country. Let's not forget that. But can I just add one thing to actually take issue with one thing you said, said Peter? Yes, it's a fact of life. We have to live with it, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the second fucking time in 16 years when we've had a dangerous president electored. Not elected, electored. So look, how do you think the Republicans would have responded to this? This is such an outrage. You, they would have been marching on Washington. Right. Yes. You know, we have not had a, a election integrity in the United States in decades, if not before. And the Democrats are right there. What did they do? Yeah. They, we have a, this is a, one of the issues that we can mobilize around. I mean, fill out a ballot, put it in a box, and count it in your district. And the voting machines can be hacked. That was proven in 2004. I mean, there's just, we don't have election integrity. And th that we have to fight to get back in a very big way. OK, and the next question. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question. You know, it's um, been almost two weeks, and we're still trying to figure out what happened. And it's, uh, and we can't, because it wasn't a rational process. It was an emotional process. And there, in in a in a uh, electorate that's closely divided, there are many reasons why the outcome was the way it turned out. Hillary won the popular vote, but lost the electoral college. So we we blame the electoral college. The media created Donald Trump. Do we blame the media? Uh, voter suppression, voter fatigue. This was a long, long campaign, including the primaries, and given the candidates who existed, people said, to hell with this. I'm not even going to bother voting. So, but here we are, we're left with the results. And yes, thank you, and, and Comey, that's correct. So we can blame Comey. But it doesn't matter, we're left with the results. Now it's a question of what we do. The US military empire and NATO are the police force for the transnational capitalist class worldwide. So events like the invasion of Iraq, the overthrow, in, in, the attempted overthrow in Syria, certainly Gaddafi in Libya, um, fit into the policy direction to protect capital and capital growth worldwide. That's an important understanding to, to have when we talk about power. And it's certainly an important understanding to have when we talk about Trump. The CIA, the NSA, military intelligence remain the primary players in terms of covert activities as well as overt and wars, mostly post 9-11. 9-11 benefited the transnational class significantly, as did the various wars and permanent war in, in the world. And we have to regard that as an ongoing circumstance 
of consideration by any power elite in any country. You know, this is a, a rise of a corrupt, extreme wing of the American uh, power elite, their deep state, whatever you call it, that has taken power. And they've taken power through the uh, con artistry, the showmanship uh, of this man, Donald Trump, who uh, we don't know exactly what extent he'll control his own government. Um, he certainly is a good front man. Uh, Sheldon Wolin, and I studied under G. William Domhoff too uh, uh, when I was a student years ago at UC Santa Cruz, and Sheldon Wolin was another professor of mine there, and he uh, coined this term inverted totalitarianism. He said that America was headed towards or was in the midst of a, a state where kind of a bureaucratic, uh, a banal uh, corporate state was ruling in a neo-fascist way, but there wasn't being led by a charismatic figure, uh, the way we historically have come to know fascism, uh, Mussolini, uh, Hitler, and so on. Well, we now know we've come to that moment. Uh, we have a charismatic figure uh, who has channeled the anger and deep grievances of uh, many, many people, working people in this country, and has ridden that to power. And there's a reason why uh, he was able to do that. And that was largely through the failure of the Democratic Party, which had been taken over, <laughs> taken over by a corporate crowd, a neoliberal crowd, that divorced itself from the pain and the anger and the frustrations and the needs of millions and millions of people. And now we are uh, reaping, uh, reaping, unfortunately, the seeds of that discontent. So look, you know, Trump came out of the failure of the Democratic Party to mobilize people and lead people and represent people. And we need to step into that vacuum now, the progressive movement. Thank God for Bernie Sanders. He's showed the way. And thank God that Bernie hasn't given up the fight and he is still leading it with his group, Our Revolution. So look. No matter where you live, no matter where you are, you need to join something right now. Even if you're kind of uh, on the spectrum and you're, you know, you're not that much of a joiner, you need to join. We all need to fight this together. It's a culture war. I applaud the, the cast of Hamilton for standing up at the end of that play and confronting Vice President Mike Pence. Trump has a de uh, demanded apology, I think, in the great New York style. They should tell him, we got your apology right here, pal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a big building in Washington, D.C., the Center for Global Development. Okay, that's like Richard Blum's building in Berkeley, right? We know that one next to the journalism school, okay? Something about poverty. <laughs> okay, if you, if you look up the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C., the head is Larry Summers. Um, I have a, a quick comment and then a question. Um, let me see. So I'm not an a evangelical or fundamentalist Christian. However, I've taken some trouble to try to understand what that worldview is about. <laughs> Given that it has a, um, and I don't appreciate sar sarcasm actually because I think it's important to really try to understand where other people are coming. Um, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. So, so, um, and I'll just give a quick example. There's the largest evangelical church in San Francisco actually came out in support of inclusion for GLBT members and then was attacked from all over the country by other churches and religious pundits for doing that. I thought that was incredibly brave and it was a very interesting, intelligent discussion that I paid attention to. So my question would be um, what, what I often see among us on the left is a complete dismissal of the... So let's start with Christ and reach religious uh, Christians that way. Not just Christ, but the early Christian saints said, I'm a Christian, I'm not able to fight. That's why Saint Martin left the army when he became a Christian. There's a, there's a strain in Christianity which uh, Marxism turned its back on. First Russia and then China tried to stamp out religion and they weren't able to do it. I'm saying that because here in America, not so true now, but I certainly saw it when I was younger, that people on the left tended to think that religion was the problem and they uh, attacked 
<coughs> religion. We shouldn't do that. There's too much hate in this country. It's coming from all over. It should not come from us. We should oppose vigorously, but we should never hate. We should welcome people who are very different from us, who come from a position that we may not personally respect at all. So I'm very glad you raised that point. Thank you. When you have someone like uh, Mike Pompeo, a uh, Koch brothers, uh, uh, you know, creation in many ways, taking over the CIA, uh, Michael Flynn as national security advisor. These people are people who demonize entire populations. The entire Muslim population, Michael Flynn has called uh, a malignant cancer. Uh, Islam itself, a malignant cancer. These men are serious about killing our environment, killing the water we drink, killing the air we breathe. We need to fight them as if our survival is at stake, because you know what? It is at this point. I just want to say that I think everybody should consult their own heart where they can put their energy most. The, uh, the alternatives are electoral politics, and I, I include that third party, fourth party po politics like Jill Stein, versus popular movements like Occupy. My own heart was with Occupy. I want to talk about, I think, some mistakes that Occupy made, and I think Larry's already mentioned one of them. If you're going to get anywhere, you have to be very disciplined. You can't be leaderless. The idea was that we're against leaders. No, you need leaders. You lead discipline. You have to enforce uh, nonviolence because the easy technique for those in power is to send in a couple of provocateurs and then the police come in, break your head. I've seen it happen. I know it's true. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so. Um, I would like to see an Occupy that has got their eyes not on what we do tomorrow, but what we're going to do in four years. And you build from the bottom up, from the bottom up, all different kinds of people. And you fight out your differences among yourselves in an organized, disciplined way. And you create a movement because I don't think any political party is going to solve this problem until there is a movement in this country which is more powerful than any of the parties.